This programming is sponsored by the Dan L. Duncan Comprehensive Cancer Care Center at Baylor St. Luke's Medical Center. Offering comprehensive cancer care that is compassionate, personalized, and driven by clinical research. More at stlukeshealth.org slash cancer. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the friends of KUHF Houston. Today, the very first airmail service is used to break a siege. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. Bismarck's Prussian troops had Paris under siege in September 1870. They surrounded the city and cut its communication lines. One reason Paris managed to withstand the siege for five months was her airmail service. And since this was 33 years before the Wright brothers flew, you may well wonder what I'm talking about. Well, I'm talking about balloons. The first hot air and hydrogen balloons had flown in Paris 86 years before the siege. Balloons had seen their first serious military use 10 years before in the American Civil War. Lincoln set up an air balloon corps in 1861. For two years, the American armies in the East had been pretty static. The Union Army had 10 balloons in service most of that time. They rose on tether lines to reconnoiter enemy positions. Some even used telegraph to communicate with the ground. Those balloons were useful until the war started moving faster than the few balloons could. The Corps disbanded in 1863, but it had established that you can gather information from the air. Now, seven years later, Paris had an urgent need to communicate with the outside world. The French were already using tethered balloons to observe the enemy. Now they decided to set up an airmail service. They sent out a call for every existing balloon in Paris, and they set up shops for building far more balloons. In all, 66 balloons left Paris carrying information to France beyond the German lines. Most flights were made at night. In all, the balloons delivered 102 passengers and 11 tons of mail. The mail amounted to 2.5 million letters. The balloons also delivered 400 carrier pigeons for return mail. To bring mail back by pigeon, the French outside Paris used early photography to reduce 16 pages of text to a a one-and-a-quarter by two-inch piece of film. But pigeons are unreliable. Only one in eight ever arrived back. The balloonists had their troubles, too, but less than anyone expected. Two were lost at sea. Six were captured by the Germans when they landed. When others came down behind enemy lines, their pilots managed to deliver the mail anyway. One landed on an island off the coast of Brittany. The most dramatic flight of all was one that landed in a Norwegian forest after an astonishing 875-mile trip. One flight carried the head of the Paris provisional government. He landed in an oak tree, but he landed safely nonetheless. Getting back to Paris was another matter. You can't control where balloons go, so Paris lost an aeronaut on every flight. Several tried to catch favorable winds and fly back in. None succeeded. The very last flight out, made on January 28, 1871, carried news of the armistice. And so the point had been made. Flight meant communication. This was the harbinger of enormous change. The world had been altered in ways that would reach far beyond one more forgotten war. I'm John Leanhart at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This programming is sponsored by Trinity University, where the spirit of inquiry can inspire a resilient and diverse community of lifelong learners to answer questions and question answers. More information at trinity.edu slash values.